So without further ado, we are so excited to talk about Amplify Innovation. Um, it was formerly known as Tech 20 XX, whatever that year might have been. Um, and it's always been kind of a, a shining star for us. We love providing a platform for which students can share their stories and who doesn't love celebrating what their learners can do. In 2019, there were over 400 students and teachers from 115 different schools throughout the state of Illinois that shared examples and stories of innovative uses of technology and digital learning during what was Tech 2019 um, at the State Capitol building in Springfield. We were so grateful for the support from all the senators and representatives who visited this technology showcase throughout the day. But the true highlight of the day was the students being engaged with the elected officials, inviting them to see meaningful learning experiences through a student's perspective. There was so much um, connection and storytelling and the kids really felt empowered. 2020 then happened and it wasn't exactly the same. In 2020, um, instead of meeting with those individual representatives um, at the state capitol building, we were kind of shut down already. And so instead, IDEA put together a series of books um, that were authored by the students themselves. So instead of being at the state capitol and talking with the representatives, they wrote individual chapters of a three series book um, and the books are entitled student voice in the classroom student voice in the community and student voice at home and it was just so amazing to see the students come alive in their writing and their creativity and their storytelling so we took what could have possibly been a really sad experience and flipped it in a way that was really remarkable and created some young authors from it. This year is different yes, yet again. This year we will not be heading to Springfield, but instead we are going virtual, which is so incredible because there is no application process. You don't have to even fill out a form to apply. You are already in it. And so we're just asking that you tell your students, you have your students tell their stories. You share the great work that they've been doing in the classroom and how technology has helped support that great work um, in the form of a video. And so this year's um, perspective is still from the students. However, the students are going to become these media experts and create a no more than 10 minute video, which we will share with all representatives throughout the state. And then we will have a live meet and greet. To help you kind of conceptualize this um, and build this into the work you're already doing though, we have created some um, lessons for you to use as a framework. We are not in the business of adding one more thing. And so that is why we are proud to share a unit that kind of guides teachers and students um, to participating in Amplify Innovation. So this year, let's see why my picture isn't popping up. Well, there's usually a graphic here. It was like 30 seconds ago, but I'll show that later. So this year, we've created a unit plan called Pass the Mic. I am on the IDEA Illinois website and when I go to events and Amplify Innovation Student Showcase, that's where all the information will be housed. That's kind of our hub and connection with you. So the first thing, and you should have received this in your email already, is the Pass the Mic Unit Plan. This is standards-based and aligned to the ISTE standards as well. Um, and it walks you through a way of introducing the idea of empowering your students um, and leveraging technology to pass the mic to them so that they can showcase all of the learning that they've done throughout this year, throughout last year, and how technology has made that possible for them. So the unit goal itself is to connect our learners to the world is to break down those four walls of their classroom and 
help them feel like what they're doing is making a difference. We want them to become advocates of their learning and showcase the skills they are learning on a much bigger platform than just their classroom. The overview of the showcase itself is that it will be virtual. Students will be creating videos in whatever tool they like, whether it's just the camera app on their phone, or perhaps it's a tool like WeVideo or Book Creator or Loom, any screencasting um, tool that they're comfortable with or you're comfortable with, we want you to be able to use that as a means to communicate. So we're not saying you have to make it in a specific program. As long as it's a movie file, we're good to go. So let's take a look at the unit itself. Lesson one is all about students as advocates. So what that process looks like in order for students to become an advocate of their learning and take ownership. This is aligned to ISTE standard 4A. Students know and use a deliberate design process for generating ideas, testing theories, creating innovative artifacts, or solving authentic problems. So you see it's not content-based, nor is it age-specific. So what I've linked here is a slide deck that you can either go through on your own, pick and choose, cherry pick what works for you, or share directly with your students. Um, take pieces out, make copies of it, however you wanna use it, it is yours to use. But the whole point is for students to become advocates over their own learning. So the innovative designer standard is what we've just talked about. Um, and this entire lesson or this entire unit um, was based on the work of Dr. Sawson Jobber. And what she says is, what we do not say is as important and as impactful as what we do say. And so it's important that we share our students' voices with the world because the silence often speaks louder than what we are actually saying. So the first step in this process is reframing the traditional classroom. We've already done that. We've been doing that. Um, the pandemic forced our hand in many ways, but it's also a mindset shift. So instead of thinking, what can I provide for students? What can I do for them? Think about what can I do with them? What skills have I taught them up until this point that's empowered them to take on a new step within their learning? How can I include them in the conversations when it comes to planning and adapting lessons? And what tools can I leverage to support this mindset? The process itself has three steps and the fourth is more of resources for you. So to get your students to become empowered advocates of their learning first, they have to examine what it is that they're doing. I've broken the, each section up by grade level because I know what works in older grade levels may not work so well in younger grade levels and vice versa. I've also tried to be very specific with the language that I've used so that words like implicit bias and personal beliefs and ideate and iterate are used in the upper grades versus the, the lower grades. The lower grades were leveraging different vocabulary, um, maybe even just starting with the, the word advocate itself. So when our upper grade students are examining their learning styles, how do they learn best? How do they engage with content best? That's um, getting them to become scholar activists. They must first know what's working for them before they can act. This section is lined, aligned loosely to the um, sustainable development goals. And by using those sustainable development goals, they're seeing students in their shoes around the world that are already being advocates, that are already saying, this is what I feel strongly about, this is how I learn best, and feeling empowered enough to do something about it. If as an upper, um, grade level teacher, you haven't dug into the sustainable development goals yet, I highly, highly recommend it. They are life-changing. So in addition to um, examining their own implicit bias or their predisposition when it comes to learning, there's also activities that I've, I've created that students can 
either walk through on their own or you as the teacher can lead. So um, there are the sustainable development goals that I just showed you. So upon seeing them, what are your students' initial reactions? They could perhaps blog, write a journal about this, um, podcast. Do the issues that are in the sustainable development goals affect you? Why or why not? So we're really getting them to think about and putting a mirror up to the learning that's going on in their classrooms, in their schools, in their little um, fishbowl versus what's happening everywhere else in the world. So they're seeing why their voice is really powerful, but also really important right now to share. For our younger learners, let me go back one, hold on. For our younger learners, the examine piece is loosely K-7. Obviously you can use your best judgment, but instead of being about implicit bias, it's more about the learner dispositions. So do I learn best um, as someone who's listening? Do I learn best as a sketch noter? Do I learn best when I'm um, voicing my opinion? What skills as a learner do I need to have in order to learn the content? And I've linked the actual learner dispositions here from the Institute for Arts Integration and STEAM. I love this guide. Um, it's, it's all about teaching habits of mind. And I love teaching the brain research behind all of the work we do with students. So if you look down, scroll down, there's 16 different habits. So what is it that your students are working on now? Are they working on impulsivity like my first grader is? Um, are they working about on listening and understanding and empathy? So is empathy that key vocabulary term you're going to work on with them? As always, we're, we're thinking about being flexible because we were forced to be flexible. So all of these habits of mind are great introductions to being advocates of their own learning. Each of them is also aligned to either a video clip or um, a one pager graphic that is aligned to the Disney, different Disney movies, like Inside Out, like Toy Story. So when you see Woody here, it's not just a random picture, but they've taken all of these habits of mind and align them to Pixar movies and Disney movies, which is really cool. But it also helps students connect the content better and anchor it to something that they already know about. Knowing their learner disposition, what's their strength? So first and foremost, are they good with their, um, with their behaviors? Are they not an impulsive learner? Are they able to focus? Are they flexible? So first and foremost saying, this is my strength. Now, what could I stretch? What could I improve upon? And how can my attitude impact that? So you can see the major difference in between the um, activities for the younger students versus the activities for the older students. The older students are pulling them more into the global perspective, whereas we're trying to get the younger learners to first realize who they are as a learner why that matters and how they can become empowered to one day think more globally. So the second um, activity within this, this lesson is listening. Um, and there's an activity called the force field analysis, which is really cool to do with students. And you can ask them to create kind of a mind map of the process that you, um, model for them. So first, you ask the students to identify a goal that they've had this year within school. So as an educator, my goal might have been to get you to learn XYZ. And I made that very clear to them. They have to leave third grade knowing cursive, for example. Then you articulate and break down and analyze how they met that goal how they didn't meet that goal, what you did as a teacher to get them to make that goal and provide a description of what that success looks like. So they're mind mapping, they're showing in pictures and drawing um, that the steps of the process that you took for that goal to be successful. And then you can have a conversation about their process when it comes to what they saw themselves being successful with. Um, and then that's where the idea of metacognition comes in. 
So talking about thinking about their own thinking and why that's so important and impactful for them to do right now. And then for our upper grades, it's all about authentic feedback and connecting with their peers. So figuring out who in their life impacts them, whether it's advertisements or um, the people they go to school with, their teachers, their family, and then also trying to open up their, um, their pool of who impacts them to a greater audience, understanding the unique situations that others may be in right now that don't come from the same background as them. This enables them to become a change maker. So that's the next level. They're, they're advocates and then they have to become learners beyond themselves. And the activity for them is this awesome TED talk called The Danger of Silence by Clint Smith. Um, so it's just a matter of them watching it. It's a, it's a quick one and reflecting on it. And then I have curated a YouTube playlist of a bunch of different podcasts. And the idea behind this is they determine what did they connect with? Why did they connect with it? Was it the content? Was it the delivery? Was it they related to the speaker? And how could they leverage those things when they go to create a video to share their story? Do they need to be funny? Do they need to be uh, more open-minded? What from these podcasts can they kind of take away and use when they're creating their video content? And maybe it's also the non-examples. Maybe the things that didn't resonate with them are things that they're gonna try not to do. And so that's all about empowering them to find what works. All right, so then the next portion is amplify. And for our younger learners, it's all about telling your story. And we want them to feel like they're going to be recognized, their voice matters, and that so many people want to hear their story. And right now, these people that they're gonna to talk to are decision makers that could change the way that they do school in the future. So how can we get our younger learners to feel like their voice matters and that their story is important? And so something called reciprocal teaching, which I'm sure you've done a billion times, um, comes to mind with this. And so if you take a couple of minutes at the end of every day and you ask students to teach you something, anything, you will be amazed at the things they bring to you. It could be something as silly as how to tie dye a shirt, or my mom taught me how to make a quesadilla, or any number of things that don't have to necessarily be educational based, but you're showing them that their stories matter and that the things that are important to them are important to you. And so by being successful in this form of reciprocal teaching, students feel more likely to take risks when you ask them to do it for a video that's going to go to their um, representatives and legislators. So this is such a great way for students to get empowered and it's something you can just build in even as a brain break in the middle of your day. For our upper grades, amplification of their voice is all about activism. So they need to use their position, their power, their privilege to figure out what it is that they're passionate about to talk about. And this activity is also reciprocal teaching and I love this graphic. Um, but what you do is you take something you're already teaching and you embed this strategy in this approach. Questioning, summarizing, clarifying, predicting. And then as students go through this process with social studies that they're doing with you or math, they're able to see the need for the content that they're learning. And they're able to justify that learning that's happening as well. So I've linked in the um, presenter notes, some videos that go with reciprocal teaching strategies for upper grades as well. But this is something that could be applied to any subject area that you are already planning on teaching. 
Lastly, we have to provide mirrors, windows, and doors for our students. For them to be able to leave a footprint, make an impact, we have to put a mirror up to them so that they see their implicit bias or their preconceived notions. We have to give them a window so they can see someone else's and a door, which is Amplify Innovation, to make a difference above it. And so what I've done, actually Dr. Jaber has done this for us, is curated some resources technology-wise that allows students to do this. So whether it's Flipgrid or Google Docs or taking pictures of things, mind mapping, there are ways that students can leverage technology to help them become advocates over their learning. So that is all in lesson one within this shareable unit. So you can kind of layer it on the work that you're already doing in your classroom. Um, I've also linked um, her presentation called We Are Here, which is more on social justice and equity. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, um, cultivating your, your students as advocates, that's an amazing presentation as well. But I'll pause for a second and check the chat to see if there's anything that I need to add. Looks like we're all on the same page so far. And big thank you to Whitney for helping me manage the chat and adding those links. All right, so let's pop over to lesson two. And if you know me, you know that I love Kevin Carroll. He um, keynoted IdeaCon, he brought the house down at the end. His passion is contagious. And so lesson two just made sense to utilize his work. Lesson two within this unit is aligned to ISTE standard 1A. Students articulate and set personal learning goals, develop strategies leveraging technology to achieve them and reflect on the learning process itself to improve learning outcomes. That piece is very important. So many times we get crunched for time and we pull out that reflection piece because we have to keep going. So this lesson is all about finding your passion. What in education, what in my classroom this year really inspired me? What was that spark? So I've created another slide deck for you to use. And I definitely recommend going through this with students. But if you're, if you're not one to do that, I also made videos for you so you could just share my videos. But we're thinking about this through the lens of, or through the perspective of what stuck with me from this school year. And I think that's a question that could be um, asked of first graders and 12th graders. What's that content that you were like, ooh, this is gonna be fun. So that's, that's where our mindset is on this um, experience. And it's based on the book, Rules of the Red Rubber Ball. I highly recommend you get this if you don't already have it. It's, I read through it all the time. And so you take your students through this process one slide at a time. It's almost like a meditation where you could have the lights down low, you could have music playing as you go through each of the slides. Each of the slides asks the students a reflection question. So first, what's your red rubber ball? Well, it's hard to answer that without knowing what you mean by red rubber ball. And so Kevin unpacks it through these series of questions. Well, what learning activities do you like? What do you like about school? What do you like to learn about? Maybe it's not in school. Maybe it's you like to learn about um, fixing parts of a car. Okay, what learning do you like? What hobbies do you have? So you're having students reflect on their personal lives as well. What inspires you? What dreams do you chase? What topics do you love to discuss and ponder? This is one that my husband could not narrow down because he could talk about anything. And I'm sure you have students like that too. But when that topic comes up where you're like, okay, we're gonna talk about Grey's Anatomy, you're like, I am here for it. What topics do you love to discuss and ponder? What about learning brings you joy? 
So the big thing to focus on is when you don't have to focus on anything at all, where does your mind wander to in school? What do you think about when you're daydreaming? That's your red rubber ball. For Kevin Carroll, it was a basketball. That's the red rubber ball for him. That's what saved his life because he poured everything he had into playing basketball. He had to do his homework so he could play basketball. He had to exercise so he could play basketball. He had to eat right so he could play basketball. So what of your students do they focus on? Are they passionate about in school that sets them up? in life to succeed. I have to do this because I'm so passionate about whatever the case may be. So it takes you through the whole process and the next steps. After I think I have my red rubber ball, after I think I know what I'm passionate about, maybe it's reading, maybe it's writing, math, um, it tells you as the student what you have to do. Okay, so you have to commit to it. What does commitment look like? Again, we can pull out these key vocabulary terms. We can spotlight people in the public eye. You know, Michael Jordan, what a commitment look like for him? What a commitment look like for this person? Maybe people in your district that are educationally famous. And it takes you through this wheel of now, what are the steps that you have to take for this passion to be truly at the center of everything you do so that you don't lose sight of it no matter what? It also empowers students to realize that their best investment is themselves. So you're connecting with them on a totally different level. So now they know that they have to advocate for their learning. Step two is figuring out what the learning is that they wanna advocate and talk about. So I have to share my voice. I'm gonna share my voice about this. How am I gonna do that? So you can see how every step of this unit brings them a little bit closer to Amplify Innovation. So I've got all of these um, extra resources linked in here as well. So if you clicked within the slide deck over here, um, what's your red rubber ball is actually a PDF that you can use to guide your instruction as well. So you have this slide deck to show, you've got the PDF with activities which are so phenomenal and, and really relevant. And then I've also created these videos, which is basically a recording of what I just did with you. So it's walking your students through, figuring out what their red rubber ball is. So it's broken into two videos so that they're consumable. Um, they're four minutes each so that you're not spending a huge amount of class time on it. They can reflect after part one come back to part two, you can push it out in Edpuzzle on Google Classroom, whatever works for you, or you can just demonstrate it yourself. But it's a very powerful activity that you can do with students over any amount of time, whether it's a day, a week, a week and a half. I would probably commit a week to each of these lessons so that you have time to really dig in and build upon a framework. So that one's obviously you could probably tell is one of my favorites because it's about passion projects and almost like genius hour. So let's jump next to lesson three. And lesson three is rooted primarily in the ISTE or the international technology standards um, because it's on research and development. And I think oftentimes we throw our kids into the deep end of the pool and we say, okay, you're doing a project on this person, go find some information. And there was one time where I, I did this with students and the girl, one girl did a, pres a presentation on um, Oprah, but none of the pictures that she pulled in were of Oprah. She's like, it's okay, it's not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal, but I hadn't yet taught her about research and design and development for her to realize that it was important to credit the source, to make sure the pictures were accurate, to proof, to prove all of the research she was doing was actually factual information. So that's lesson three. Um, and this is aligned to standards 3A, 3C, and 3D, or 3A, B, C, and D, sorry. 
so they can employ these research strategies, they evaluate for accuracy, they use a variety of digital resources in meaningful ways, um, and they are actively exploring real world issues. So no longer are they saying, why do I have to know and learn this? Instead, they're telling you why they have to know and learn this. So I have put together a digital citizenship, we'll say like a prize bin. So you can kind of pick and choose which of these activities you'd like to do with your students, which fits your classroom dynamic the best. And it's all about committing to this digital citizenship. Digital citizenship shouldn't be just one more thing that's added on or that's taught in the library, but instead something that is ongoing in your classrooms. And so the first activity that I love to do is based on the app Snapchat and it's called Snap and Chat. Um, and it's all about the permanency of posts. So talking about how something you think that is going to disappear doesn't necessarily disappear and how perception is reality. And we use our students, um, if they're older, their mobile devices, they can use their phone and get the pictures on their phone. If they're Zooming, they can use the pictures that are hanging up around their house and if they're younger students. Um, and if they're coming into the classroom, they could even use photo albums and talking about the stories that pictures tell that we share, the stories we intend for the pictures to tell, and then the perception. And it really is a powerful and impactful um, activity. Also in here is a digital citizenship survival kit. In this one, it's a matter, I just have boxes of all of this stuff. I don't tell the students that it's about digital citizenship. They have to figure out how all of these things correlate what they mean. And there's things like a toothbrush, toothpaste, a packet of seeds, an extension cord, a permanent marker, whiteout. And they have to kind of make meaning to all of those pieces and then come up with a name for what the box is. It's a real, that's a really fun activity. Then there's some more ISTE um, standards and this awesome video that ISTE's put together on the different components of digital citizenship how it's not just this one overarching theme, but it's really broken up into digital self. How do I portray myself online? Digital interactor. How do I provide feedback? Or how do I share co others' content? How do I interact with others online? And then digital agent. How do I research and make sure that online content is accurate? And so that's an, a really great video to share. These are the different um, indicators underneath the digital citizenship standard, which again, you can break apart at the upper grades and talk about which one is going to impact your passion project that you're sharing. So a bunch of different activities that you can use. And then this one I think is the most useful um, because it is a wakelet that I've curated on well, let me see if i can move my window here got it um it's a wakelet of a bunch of different sites that have fair use images now google has been doing a great job updating their work um, and their tools so that if you search within google slides those images are copyright free and fair to use but they, sometimes they don't have the exact image that you want to use. So if your students are creating stories that they want, not necessarily a real photo um, in, but perhaps instead they want to find a picture, these are all some places that they can go to get those. So Flat Icon is a website, it's freemium, so there's free and paid versions of it, but it's more icon based, which is great for infographics but Unsplash and Pixabay are actual photos. And so if they put in a key term um, like poverty or, or hunger, they're going to get actual photos that support their work. I love using Slides Carnival. There's Slides Mania, Slides Carnival. There's a couple of different free sites. I'll just pop into this one real quick. So that the work of being creative 
when it comes to Google Slides, is already done for you. You don't have to think about the inspiration and the color scheme and, and the structure of the slide deck because it's already made for you. So this is a really great place for students who are kind of stuck on where do I even begin? Send them to one of these places and then automatically it's downloadable into um, PowerPoint or Google Slides. So when we scroll down here, I can download it in Microsoft or Google. I can preview it like this. But you can see it's already got kind of the creative elements to it that students don't have to start from scratch. And then you're not getting the same exact copy of the same slide deck over and over again. So Slides Carnival, Slides Mania, um, SlidesGo.com are all great places for that. But this Wakelet has a ton of different places where you can get images that are fair use, relevant, and more impactful because it's not just something that was grabbed straight from Google, which I think is a, an important lesson to share with our students. And then the last part of the digital citizenship lesson is the DigSit Amazing Race. I am all about gamification and playing games. And this is something you can do virtually or in person with devices where it really breaks down experiencing the power of digital citizenship, the pitfalls, as well as the opportunities for it to be leveraged so that you can be successful, how we interact in an online community and how that follows us. So there's different um, activities for students to practice in different platforms, whether it's Seesaw, Google Classroom, um, Canvas, Schoology, whatever you'd like to use. There are some strategies for you to employ for students to experience things without actually posting on Twitter or posting on Facebook or making themselves vulnerable on social media. It's fun because you set it up as a competition in teams um, and they get to see who wins the amazing race of digital citizenship at the very end. So that is the um, next part of our shareable unit, lesson three, again, rooted in the ISTE standards. And I'll check the chat one more time. I will add Slides Carnival, Slides Go, all of that to the Wakelet so that it's all in that one-stop shop. Lastly is lesson four. So we've spent one, two, three weeks. First, we're, we're figuring out why we have to be advocates. Why do I need to tell my story? Who wants to hear it? Okay, now I get it. I know I have to tell my story. What am I gonna tell my story about? What am I passionate about? What learning do I need to share with the world? How am I gonna share this story so that it makes sense, so it resonates with people? Where can I get resources to support the fact that my passion in school should continue to be taught or we should take it even further? I know there's many students who believe that Minecraft should be taught in schools. Why? That's that big research piece. So lastly is how am I gonna show this? What, what pretty packaging can I make all of this stand out to these legislators and that's leveraging technology. So there's a ton of resources here for you and I'll unpack them, but it's based on the ISTE standards 6A, B, C, and D. Choosing appropriate problems to solve, choosing an appropriate tool to use to showcase that, that um, solution, being responsible when using that technology. So um, if you're on Flipgrid, using it in a responsible way, communicating your ideas in a complex manner, and then publishing your work for the world to see. And maybe your world is just your school or district, but maybe it is even bigger. It just depends on who you are and where you're from. So I've provided you with a slide deck that I would use as the teacher. I, I wouldn't necessarily share this directly with students. Um, but it takes you through several different tools that you can use with your students. Just to showcase 
how it works. And you know what? You actually could probably just share it directly with them so that if they're if they're older, they could learn the tools on their own and you don't have to use um, you know, valuable class time. But the tools that I've unpacked in this slide deck are Google Slides, Pear Deck, Jamboard, We Video, Flipgrid, and Loom. Because those are all really great presentation tools. Um, so each slide tells you a little snapshot of what the tool is all about. Then there's a getting started guide for each one. How do I even begin to use this tool? Then the next step is check out these cool ways this tool is being used. And in fact, look at this. I'm ahead of myself already. All those slides templates are right there. So you'll be able to get those and um, be off and running. But the cool things you can do tab on each of them is fun because it shows unique ways that you could be using Google Slides that maybe you didn't think of originally. And maybe your students would want to use in a screencast. Maybe they are building a Google Slide and it's um, they're uploading it to tall tweets and now it's a GIF. So that tab is really that next step. So we've got like kind of that differentiation. How do I get started with this tool? I don't need that. I want to know how I can use it in a different way. Same goes for Pear Deck, oops, which the students could use Pear Deck in a live lesson with their, their peers and record that, bring that to the legislators' attention. The other thing I've included on a lot of these is um, frequently asked questions. So do I need a subscription to this or does my tech department need to whitelist this? All the little logistical things that so often um, have us turning away from these tools, I've listed here for you. I've also um, went and found the technical and legal components. So all of these tools are SOPA compliant, which means that it's not taking data, private data from your students and storing it. Um, it's completely, uh, everything is above board, so you don't have to worry about that. But if it's a tool that maybe your kids or your, your district doesn't allow your kids to have access to, I've done the legwork for you so you can kind of justify it. No, they're gonna, they need to use it, here's why. Um, so that's linked in technical and legal on each of them. Typically Google Slides is kind of a no-brainer, but um, then there's also 20 ways to use that tool. And the one that I really wanted to take a minute is Jamboard. So 20 ways to use Jamboard will link you to Ditch That Textbook, which has tons of phenomenal resources. But he shares not only all these different ways that you can use it, but these templates too. So you don't even have to recreate this. So it's like, look at how you can use it to annotate um, a story. Instead of just saying, oh, I'm gonna have to build that. He's like, here, take this. So I highly recommend uh, popping over to this to check out, if, only, if anything, just build up your Jamboard templates. But this is great inspiration for your students if they're, they're trying to communicate ideas in unique ways, or they're trying to pull learners within their class and get a point across. Um, so that is the case with a couple of them. Jamboard, um, Flipgrid has it as well. And then, so 40 ways to use Flipgrid. Flipgrid is like limitless, but also before I get ahead of myself, it also connects with all of these amazing tools. So even if you're not ready to dig into Flipgrid, maybe you're like, huh, what's this Wonderopolis about? I love Wonderopolis for K-5. So maybe you'll find a tool instead of one of these big ones. But then a screencasting tool like Loom is just kind of an easy way for your students to showcase their work. So it's almost like what I'm presenting right now in Zoom, you see me, but you also see my slides. That is what Loom does. It's free. Um, it's super easy to use. Students can draw while they're writing. They can have multiple presenters, bring in presentations. You can see how many people have viewed it. So I love using the tool Loom for recording presentations or instructional videos. So first, uh, and giving credit, Slides Mania. That's where I got that cute template. 
So this template I did not create from scratch. I downloaded it so that I could add just my content to it, which is such a lifesaver. So that's the first part of lesson four. Next, we have a ton of resources shared by Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the CEO of Cult of Pedagogy. Um, she has created this tech checkerboard, which is amazing because this is the next level. So I know what tool I want to use. Why do I want to use this tool? Do I want my audience to see collaboration? Or do I want them to just enjoy this experience? Or am I publish publishing this in some capacity? So it narrows down the focus from now I've got my tool that I need. What is the use of my tool? What's the purpose of it? And maybe it's not a good fit. Maybe it's like, oh, I really want them to see how uh, my teacher has personalized learning, but I don't think that the tool I picked supports that. So this is just narrowing that focus. Um, she also has uh, a blog every year at Tech Tools to try in whatever the year may be. And so she narrows it down to six different tools. She's got this huge guide of tech tools that she's constantly updating, but that is a paid resource. So I put a little asterisk down here. That is something that isn't free. If you buy a license for it, you can only use it for your own classroom. You can't share it with other teachers. There's multiple licensing um, opportunities for purchasing, but if you just purchase the one, it's just for you. But a, uh, a good alternative to that is from our friends at Book Creator. And Book Creator has um, an ambassador program, which is so cool because they collaborate on all the amazing ideas that they're doing with Book Creator. And they have put together this epic book of web tools. This is free. This is shareable with students, whether they have a mobile device or a computer. It's web-based and app-based. And I'm going to flip through it. The table of contents has everything listed that is included in this book. So when I first looked at this, I was like, whoa, that's a lot, that's overwhelming. But if you go to, after you see all of the amazing authors, look at all these people that contributed to it. I mean, that's pretty cool that these people from all over the world got together and added their little experiences to it. So once you're ready to dig into a tool, it really breaks it down nicely. There's videos embedded, there's um, descriptions, there's uses, and then you can always go back to the index. So if you're 27 pages in and you're like, I don't wanna have to flip all the way to the back, it gives you that easy way to um, get back to that index. So there's tons, this is chock full of tons of different resources. So if you don't know the resource, don't be worried about letting your students use it. Let them dig through this book a little bit, see what could fit and support their passion project and the story they want to tell. Um, you don't have to know every single thing about every single tool that your students um, are, are working with. So let me check the chat one more time before I go on to the next. Jamboard is great. My story, I love storyboard.com. That one's awesome. I've heard many good things about storyboard that as well. Cool. I love how you all have different. Yeah, free is key. It makes a difference. Um, so lastly, some uh, frequently asked questions about Amplify Innovation. So this unit is meant to help build your confidence in passing that mic to your students. You've empowered your learners so far this year and last year in such incredible ways that should be celebrated. Your students should be recognized as should you. And so Amplify Innovation is the perfect place to do this. Um, where, when is this taking place? It's May 11th. Um, that is the live meet and greet. It's happening in a place called Wonder Me. Wonder Me is a 
it's so fun. It's, an, it's like a virtual lounge. And when you log in, it looks like this. And you'll see like each person that logs in, they have like a little icon. They're able to pop in and bump into each other and then they can talk to one another in their little circle. Um, in addition, I could send a message directly to somebody within Wonder Me, or I could use the chat. The chat itself will send private messages so to individuals, it'll send circle messages. So if you're there with your students in a circle, you could send just your students a message or you can send a message to everybody in the entire room. It's really like bumping into the hallways at a place like Springfield, but virtually. The other cool thing about it is I can also broadcast. So I can take over the entire room pauses everybody's conversations, everybody's videos, everybody's um, audio, and then it puts me on the screen and doing whatever I need to do. It tells me how many people are listening. And then all I have to do to get out of it is simply click end broadcast. And then you all go back to your regularly scheduled programming of talking to each other. Now, the way we're going to set it up is we're going to have room areas. So we want to get as many people from as many different regions as possible. So we're going to have each area named based on where you're located in the state. So your students will know exactly where they're going to gather and the representative of that state will know exactly who they want to go visit and talk to. At this point for the live meet and greet on May 11th, our representatives will already have watched your students videos. They will already have come up with some questions to ask. And so they're gonna go to your rooms, talk with your learners and ask them questions directly related to the videos that they prepared. We can add um, icebreaker questions. We could change the names. We could change our pictures. You can do all sorts of things in this wonder room. And it is, the capacity is at 15,000 people. So the amazing thing about Amplify Innovation this year is that we're not limited to just bringing four students with us. You can bring your whole class if you want. Now, I recommend trying to have them all on one, you know, if they're in the room with you, have them on one Zoom and maybe one spokesperson. But really, you can have as many students as you want as your rep representatives. So that is on May 11th from 9 to 11 a.m. And you will get a link directly bringing you to that meet and greet. Students can participate by creating their 10 minute video, telling their story. The video can showcase anything that they learned this year that helped, that technology helped enhance um, the experience for them and what hasn't technology done with, uh, with our schools this year. Students, um, will sh these will be shared with legislators for their specific region and representatives, but it'll also be uh, public viewing on our website. So we'll have all of these amazing videos for, for people to see all the amazing work that you and your students are doing. Um, the videos themselves are due April 30th, 2021 just so we have time to get them uploaded and shared with the representatives before the live event. All of these lessons that I talked about are not required. They are simply ideas to help get you started. So you will not have to prove that you've done any of these activities. It's just something to help support the work that you are doing. So not an obligation whatsoever. There's no age limit. Um, for your students to participate in the live event, they do have to make the video. Um, and at the live meet and greet, like I said, it'll be the legislators and representatives talking with your students, asking them questions. Maybe your students give a brief recap of their video, but talking about themselves and what they're passionate about. Uh, and that's, that's about it. If there are questions, I also put at the bottom where you can reach us via email. But that is the unit plan in a nutshell, unpacked. So questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I will also 
Whitney's done an awesome job sharing all the links to everything here. Again, remember, it's also all published on our website for you to be able to visit. And then lastly, before I forget, the link to your PDH for joining me today on this uh, one hour unpacking. We are going to give you a follow-up email with all the links, the recording to this session, because like I said, I'm sure you want to hear me talk for another hour again, and any other relevant information about Amplify Innovation. All we ask is you spread the word so that your students' stories can be told and the great work that you are doing can be shared on a platform that it deserves to be shared on. So that's all I have for you. If you've got questions, I'll hang out. Drop them in the chat if, if needed. Come off mute if you want to chat. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing. Your tireless efforts are not going unnoticed. We appreciate you.